All right, good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here. Welcome to the Museum of the African Diaspora. My name is Nia McAllister, and I'm the Senior Public Programs Manager here at MOAD. MOAD is a contemporary art museum, and our mission is to celebrate black cultures, ignite challenging conversations, and inspire learning through the global lens of the African diaspora. Today, we are here for our curator and artist talk for the exhibition Unruly Navigations, curated by Kijo Lee, who is our Chief of Curatorial Affairs and Public Programs here at MOAD. Woo! Woo, exactly. <laughs> Round of applause, please. So tonight, Kijo will be in conversation with artists Nafis White, Nadine Natalie Hall, and Olu Shei. And Unruly Navigations is a group exhibition featuring 10 artists ac across varying mediums and geographies. Um, the exhibition testifies to the urgent, disorderly, rebellious, and nonlinear movements of people, cultures, ideas, religions, and aesthetics that define diaspora. And so it is now my honor to introduce our esteemed guest for this evening. Nadine Natalie Hall, born in Kingston, Jamaica, is a conceptual artist <laughs> who works in installation art, sculpture, and photography. Functioning as a catalyst for social change, Hall's artworks are multi-layered constructions, autobiographic, and imbued with symbols connected to the more extensive histories of the black diasporic experience. Nafis M. White is an interdisciplinary, multi-hyphenate artist whose recent bodies of works are created from objects commonly found in beauty supply stores, industrial sites, and the seemingly limitless horizons of our global and political landscapes. Through weaving, hairdressing, sculpture, and installations, White centers the uncanny audacity of self-affirmation and love by means of repetition as a form of change. Olusheyi is a Nigerian-Canadian artist using diasporic debris, a term he coined to describe the artifacts and found objects he collects from his travels across the Atlantic. He explores black being across themes. These transformational objects are recast into sculpture, installation, performance, and photography, and their explorations invoke his personal narratives and travels within broader examination of black diasporic cultures and African spiritual traditions. And Kijo Lee is Chief of Curatorial Affairs and Public Programs at MOAD. And in this role, Lee oversees the strategic direction for the museum's exhibitions and programs, leads globally on identifying and promoting emerging artists from the African diaspora, and works to expand MOAD's reach and influence locally, nationally, and internationally. Please join me in welcoming our guests. There we go. Thank you for that, Nia. Um, I first want to thank the staff um, who's here in support, especially our programming team, Nia McAllister, who just did our introductions, and Elizabeth um, Gessel, who is over here, who is our, C our director of um, uh, public programs. I also want to say how grateful I am to be in conversation with three, these three amazing artists. So Nadine and Nafis, I've known a little while. Um, by way of Cleveland, story for another time. Olushe, I met only a year ago, a little over a year ago. And I am not trained as a contemporary art person. I was trained as an Americanist. I started in the 19th century and became really, really enamored with the ways that contemporary artists are rethinking the archive, trying to understand the gaps, not fill them in, not to endow voice to those we've lost, but how trying to think about how we actually sit with those losses and make them generative rather than having them be a deterrent or hamper our progress. And so um, what I've asked each of them to do tonight is to speak to the theme of the exhibition, to think about what is it that they are navigating both in the works that they show here in Unruly Navigations, but also in their broader pra practice. And I hope you will go along with us because it's likely to be a little bit unruly in the way that we navigate this presentation. We may jump forward and backward. There may be times when they ask me to show something I might jump, have to jump into the internet, we'll see. So please go along with us as we take this ride. So I want to welcome all three of you express my gratitude 
and to say that the response that we've been receiving, even in a day, is due to the caliber of the work. So I really appreciate that. All right, and with that, I think we will get going. <laughs> So, as I said, we have here Nadine Natalie Hall, Oluche, and Nafis M. White. So, we're going to start with Oluche. I'm going to ask you, what are you navigating in the work on view? This is a compound question, but we'll get to your practice more generally. Let's start with what you have on view here today. And so, there are three works by uh, Oluche in Unruly Navigations, including Emanado, here we'll go back one, Emanado, Good Luck Totem, and The Value of My Dreams Will Not Drown Me. And so what you're seeing in the portrait behind Oluche here is a kind of organic display, but he can tell you more about how these works are often shown. And so I'm starting with one of your reunions. Here, I'll turn it toward you so that it can help. So what are you navigating in your Emanato series specifically? Um, hello? OK. <laughs> um, I guess for me, I, I always start with what's personal for me. And I'm always trying to place my own experiences as well as my movement through the world in the context of larger migrations of black people, but also like larger ideas around African spirituality. Um, and really just trying to find what my place is within all of these things. And also what, because I've been given these gifts clearly, and they've come from my ancestors. And I'm you know, uncovering the ways in which I can contribute to black culture um, also how I can continue to promote, but also preserve Yoruba culture. Um, like, yes, I was raised in Nigeria till I was 16, but so much of that culture, and particularly the spiritual aspect of the culture, is sort of considered taboo. And you know, th this is always a result of colonization. Um, but it's such a rich culture, and I find myself wanting to delve deeper and deeper into it. You know, I was raised Catholic, but I find that I, I'm learning so much more about myself and my purpose in the world um, as I further dive into um, African spirituality. Like, I don't practice it yet as like my religion, but even just like learning about it has been like really eye-opening for me. And you know, for the first time in my life in the last five years, I feel like my life really has value. You know, it always has had value, but the value is like a lot heightened. I'm more connected to what it is I am meant to be doing. Um, so with Eminado, um, I'm traveling across the African continent, but also across the diaspora, and I'm collecting these objects and you know. Um, bringing them together and reimagining the talismans that Africans have carried on journeys across the Atlantic. Um, for me, <laughs> it, it, connecting that to what I am navigating or what I'm excavating also, because a lot of this work is actually, I dig things up in the ground, you know? Um, but it's also for me about making those connections across the diaspora. like. It's African Americans, interestingly enough, that I've learned the most about Yoruba spirituality from, and that has piqued my interest. And as a result, I've gone back to Nigeria to further my interest in that. So I'm really interested in, you know, being like a physical manifestation for that unification. You know, like I, in many ways, consider myself to be the Atlantic, <laughs> um, and my my travels bring. Through my travels and through the work that I'm doing, I'm able to make those connections across the diaspora, but also, you know, highlighting the ways in which, you know, the culture, the spirituality, 
all of that has sort of transmuted. So it's still the same, but there's differences in the expression of it. Um, yeah. So talking, thinking about your body or yourself as the Atlantic is a really interesting touch point. Can you speak a little bit about why sorry, these are, oh gosh, let me turn this back toward me. Why the emanato are in these groupings of nine, how it is that you put these objects together in these specific groups. So the Emanato series, they come together in these groupings of nine and each of them is very unique. So the individual objects are unique and then the groupings are unique. So could you say a little bit about how you bring these objects together into those into those groupings of nine and the meaning behind that? Okay, uh, so the, the number nine is significant because I have eight siblings. Um, so in thinking of like, you know, reunions of people and ideas that you know have been interrupted by colonial conquest, enslavement, but also like natural disasters, farmings, all of those things. Um, I was thinking about it within the context of my own family. Like if for any reason we were not together, um, how could the work that I'm doing keep us together? But also just thinking about um, families from before and families that are present now and families that will exist in the future. And how this work really, through my travels across the diaspora, is essentially charting the migrations and far dispersions of black people, but also finding ways to bring these people together. Because these are all objects that, without my intervention, would never have met each other. Like in one particular object, there could sometimes be as many as six parts from say Brazil, from Barbados. And when you look at the greater reunion of nine, then you're looking at you know possibly even 20, 26. And the more I travel, the richer the work will get. So, you know, so the reunions I will make five years from now could have as many as 50 countries represented in, in one grouping. It was fascinating to handle these objects. So for instance, this one reunion when you flip it over, it's like the a Ford symbol. It's a Ford the symbol, Ford the one in the I corner, yeah. I was like, is it, is it like compartment, is it the dash? Like, what's going on? And so, yeah. <laughs> explaining these were fascinating. And then it's also, you said that you put place two cowrie shells in each of Yes, this is, this is true. So, yes, <laughs> and the cowrie shell as a form is super important. So if you could speak to yeah. um, the two cowrie shells and then we'll show uh, the other two works that are in the exhibition. Yeah. Um, so I always make it a point to have at least two carry shells in each reunion, and those represent my parents. So carry shells are, you know, objects of, you know, beyond the value, like the currency and objects of embellishment. They're also um, objects of, um, sorry, fertility. They, but they both embody the masculine and the feminine. So I've always, um, I always have at least two to represent my parents, but then. Sometimes more than two because you know my brothers and sisters are having lots of babies. <laughs> <laughs> are they always actual cowrie shells, or is it also the form? Because I noticed that you will blend materials to make that cowrie shell shape, sort yes. of like this feels to me, like a, yeah, um, like a cowrie as well. Yeah, absolutely. And so, and I love these sort of intimate connections and in the ways that organic and inorganic material meet. So like this loop of hair, along with this little rubber gasket. Yeah. Um, this, uh, I can only assume, is like the insides of a CD disc player. That I, you should, it was like a little mystery search for myself. Sometimes um, I don't even know what I know, exactly, they are. and so. But if but, you go back yes, to, like, certainly. to um, slides back, so like the one on the right um, is actually, I found that in bed and the top part is the tail of a dinosaur, like a kid's toy. And then the bottom part I found in South Africa and was actually just um, like a bunch of wire with electrical tape wound around it. Um, so just to give you an idea of how things come from far and wide and they come together and suddenly you have this magical object that's you know, belong to a kid. 
And you're also an intensive record keeper. So you have the coordinates of where each of the intimate parts of these works came from. So you could actually plot out a kind of map um, of these reunions, which I think is fascinating. And again, the rigor that it takes to the intensity of practice to pay attention to those minute details and have them be invested in the way that the work is shown, I think is incredibly important. And so if you go down to our first floor corridor, you can spend some time looking to see each of these objects. And then to show how differently these works have been shown, they have, um, you, this show just closed. I have to say that with the opening of this show, Olushe, you're in how many shows simultaneously right now? Five. <laughs> Five. So, um, so uh, there are ways in which in each space, it can attend to that space. So can you talk a little bit about this exhibition and the way that these are shown in a grid and maybe what those mean, how they might mean differently? Um, so this is my solo show in Cape Town, which closed about a month ago. And that show was called Black Exodus Summer Departure. And then I had a follow-up show in Toronto, which is still on, so if you're <laughs> in Toronto in the next three weeks. And that show is called Black Exodus Win uh, Winter Arrival. So I'm really looking at that migration path and the migration story of myself, but also our ancestors uh, coming from Africa in the, you know, in the summertime where it's bright. So that show, like the gallery had white floors, white walls, everything was white. And the current show in Toronto, it's completely dark. It's like concrete floors, we painted the walls black. Um, the image you're seeing is actually a, a piece called Patra and it's, uh, it's five feet tall. Um, the, um, the, 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 black, the black bit is five feet tall, and it's entirely made of synthetic hair. Um, it's actually inspired by a maquette, an eminado that looks exactly like that. That's about, like all my eminados will fit in the palm of your hand. So it's also showing um, how I'm playing with scale. And in this instance, the cowrie shell is actually cast in porcelain. Um, and then that's a, a rock. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about this work and just to give you an idea of how I'm like pulling ideas from, you know, from times and generations and different uh, geographies. So the object that made the Eminado I actually found in Halifax, Nova Scotia in Eastern Canada on a site of Jamaican exile. So in the 1700s, about 2,000 Jamaicans were exiled to Canada and the idea was that they would just not survive. Um, but there were Jamaican Maroons, and if you know the Maroons, they, you know, they survived. <laughs> and they continue to survive, you know? We have a Maroon here. <laughs> um, so um, for me, it was, I wanted to honor that history because I thought it was, you know, a very interesting history, um, just showing the ways in which blackness and black people have survived and continue to um, survive. Um, so when I first bent that, it, it initially was just the heel of a child's shoe, but then when I bent it, it formed this shape that reminded me of a vulva. Mm -hmm. um, so it then became an object that represented, you know, the strength and resilience of especially black women, mm -hmm. um, and also just the roles and the ways, the steadfast, the steadfastness, that's a word, right? <laughs> that black women have offered me in my life. So the work is called Patra, because it's, it's named after Patra the Musician. Um, <laughs> um, who for me was the first example of um, black female um, freedom and expression. And I, I really admired Patra, like that was my idol. It's probably one of my first idols. Um, and then the work is suspended by a rock because um, I'm, I'm playing with the idea of a rock as you know, an object that can, um, can ground you, um, that can anchor you as well. Um, and the funny thing with this shape is that when you actually dissect a ship and you look into the ship, yeah. it, that, that shape is actually um, similar to the ship. So I was looking at the ways in which black women have guided me, um, but not just me personally, but globally the contributions of black women culturally, in the medical field, in technology, um, 
and the ways that they continue to do this work despite being most times not acknowledged. Um, so it's just interesting how like this tiny little kid's heel of a kid's shoe found on this site of Jamaican exile has then become this monument that celebrates black womanhood. And I'm wondering if we could take a, a small break to, I wanna ask Nadine and Nafis, because I think this is the first time you've experienced Oluche's work. So as you entered that portal, that hold, that space, what was your first impression and your reaction? I'll start with you, Nafis. All right. <laughs> um, so for one, um, so I'm extremely sensory, you know, and I like to see, feel, you know, wash over. Um, the darkness was enchanting to me, right? Being completely surrounded and surrendering into like, you know, the curiosity and moving towards. Um, there is one emanado specifically that I radiated towards, by the way, um, that has a cowrie in it, but there's also like an opening to it. And that opening, um, because of the darkness and the way the light transfers against the wall and, you know, kind of vibrates, it looks almost as if there would be a lens in that. So I felt, yeah, immediately, you know which one I'm talking about. I immediately <laughs> felt like, you know, like there was an eye, um, but like, you know, yeah, like um, like a guiding light also. I felt that I was being not necessarily watched, watched, but like held, you know? Like like just kind of like letting me know, like, um, like almost like a signal, like boop, boop, like I'm here, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And also giving me the um, uh, uh, permission maybe, uh, the kind of just like, you know, turn the corner, Nafis. Like, 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 yeah, no, 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 no. Like, you're home, like, come, come, come closer and, and turn. And then, you know, we moved and, you know, got into that gorgeous piece that I love that is the, you know, oh, yeah. <laughs> but that's the piece that, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I was just fascinated with the different, with the materiality and these totems. And um, I knew that they, for me, they stuck out as, as um, spiritual items. And um, uh, it, it connected me to like the imagery of um, African art, Haitian art, where they do a lot of collecting and um, the culture and experiences are expressed through these um, materials and the forms and uh, things that would be overlooked and insignificant. Then they take on a whole different um, meaning, value. And uh, they, they cause you to do a, a close up, mm -hmm. a close introspect, um, inspection uh, of them and I'm just fascinated with the forms and and the manipulations that you've done and the hair and uh, just these little nuggets of stories, these little pops and I'm fascinated by, by it. And then the color, the drama that brings you in, um, you're not distracted. You're not distracted, you're focused, you're, and you, the more you see, the more you want to see. Um, but my favorite is the gumball machine. What's it? <laughs> that. <laughs> yeah. So good luck, Totem. So maybe we can get a little bit into that. But I think that there is this kind of fetishistic quality to each of your practices, this way in which you each delve into the materials and it be, there's a, almost a ritual practice to each, an actual ritual practice, um, uh, and one that is driven toward um, a practice that you don't necessarily engage, but that is so compelling, and one that is a sort of um, testament, a ritual of adoration for your ancestors. Um, and so I think that is like sort of the talisman or this like tether that ties these three practices together. And I think that this also, this blend of the sacred and the profane 
or uh, um, that is uh, that I think leads us to your good luck totem. Um, and I will say that uh, because I'm a transparent person, that we had um, someone bring a handful of cowrie shells to our front desk today because they worked the mechanism. So I'm like, oh, we need a new sign. But also, <laughs> but also, <laughs> but also. <laughs> They felt so precious to them that they did not carry them away. They brought them to the front desk and said, I don't think that I'm supposed to have these. Oh. Um, and so there is something fascinating in that transaction. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> but I think that there are ways in which, um, you know, there's something very tactile about this entire exhibition. And so I wondered if you might speak to what is being navigated in Galactotum, both through the, 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 um, the vessel that you decided to place the shells in, the shells themselves, and the plinth? Okay. <laughs> um, okay. So the vessel is, is important. I don't know if you noticed, but it, the vessel has a, a beaver mm -hmm. on it. So in Canada, um, just an hour outside Toronto is uh, a company called Northern Beavers, and they make they make a lot of uh, vending machines. So a lot of the vending machines that are used in the states are actually made in Hamilton, Ontario. Um, and for me, thinking of the vending machines, they're almost like representations of capitalism, right? And the the vessel itself for me then becomes like the ship, and sometimes the person who makes the vessel is sometimes exempt from the, um, the atrocity that's associated with what happens in the vessel. So Canada made at least 60 of the slave ships that were used in the transatlantic Atlantic, um, slave trade, um, but has found this way with great PR to remove itself from this narrative of enslavement and kind of blames it all on the US. <laughs> <laughs> so for me, it was very important to um, pull, um, show the ways in which Canada is implicit um, by using this vessel. Um, so in this case, the cowries are representing blackness and black people and the ways in which we've been commodified and valued, but also devalued. Um, does that, did I answer all the questions? Yeah, yes. And the plant, 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 yes. So the plant for me, and the plant, are in various heights. So the most recent one I've made in my current show in Toronto is, I think, six feet tall. So that means the entire thing is about, I don't know, almost seven and a half feet tall. So, and all of the plinths that I'm creating are inspired by African sculptures. Um, the most recent one is actually inspired by a Malian ladder and where they just like cut grooves into the timber and then they used to climb. So I really wanted to like sort of exalt and uh, revere the cowrie as something that, you know, is worthy of its plinth. Like we're worthy of being placed up high. So, you know, as you attempt to access blackness, you're gonna be very aware of the fact that you have to extend your hand. There's an act in which, there's an act you have to perform in to gain ac um, access to blackness. It might be easy, but there's still a moment where you have to come to terms with what you're choosing to do. Yeah, fantastic, thank you. And I think we're going to return to the value of my dreams because I would like to, because this idea of marrying that sacred sort of ritual with these everyday materials and trying to ennoble and elevate them, I think connects very closely to Nadine's practice. So I want to jump to that and then I think we will come back to the value of my dreams in a moment, if that's okay. So we will come back to these beautiful hand cast cowrie shells and these other things. Very, very fast, we'll come back, I promise. So I wanted to spend a moment with you, Nadine, talking about, so we have multiple works installed on the first floor by Nadi, uh, uh, excuse me, Nadine Natalie Hall, um, the sugar works, um, as well as I think on your way out, you'll be able to try some coconut drops yourself. This person handmade 450 coconut drops for us to have here at the museum. <laughs> um, and so we will maybe start 
at the start. And so with the inspiration for those blocks and for these coconut drops, um, and if you could express to us a little bit about what you're navigating in your own personal history, in your family's history, in the works that are in the show. Okay, thank you so much. <laughs> Um, this, these images are images of my great, my maternal great-grandmother, Abigail Bogle. Um, and uh, she, she was a farmer. Um, she was married four times. Uh, her last husband, uh, she took him to court. He was wealthy, but she took him to court. And um, when he made his will, he left a penny for her but she didn't care. <laughs> <laughs> she, she, she was badass, she was an entrepreneur, she was a farmer, went to the farm on her ass, uh, uh, on a donkey, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> she rode her donkey um, to her farm, she cultivated tobacco, carrots, and cash crops, and um, she had a shop that she bought um, pastries, breads, and stuff, and she sold those. She had people selling for her in the market, and people come to her to get the goods wholesale and they go and sell their own stuff. Uh, she was a disciplinarian. She had a lot of love. She died when I was five years old, but I held on to the memories of her because at that age I knew what love was and I also knew what hate and chaos were. And she provided an alternative to my home life. Because my mother, and this is not to be read my mother, but this is the story that happened. Um, my mother um, started having kids very early. And I think she started that because her mother started having kids very early. And so children raising children, no stability, chaotic, no plans. You just have children. And so it happens. And um, so she, being at her house, there was order, discipline, she was her bone boss, and people listened to her. She set the rules and nobody broke them. And she went to church on Sunday with her mantilla and her waist was snatched and she had a bag. And I wanted to be woman. I wanted to grow up and be woman so badly because I wanted to be her. She was the epitome of woman. And um, from being this farmer, going to her farm, smoking her cigarette with the lit side in her mouth, and <laughs> yeah, and uh, eating a bucket of, of, of scotch bonnet pepper with her food. Mm. Yeah, she had to have that, and then she had a bucket of ice to cool the palate. She was that. <laughs> yeah. You know, so she, I, I mean, she died as a five-year-old, and being in, in um, like, a uh, working class setting with, you know, e emotions and stuff, and you don't get that nurturing. Again, I'm not complaining, I'm just telling you how it is. Um, and so I was heartbroken for the first time. I did not know what it was, but I was heartbroken. And I, I, I don't know, my spirit just clung to her. And so um, she taught my mother how to make the coconut drops. Uh, my grandmother sent my mother to her to escape my father. Mm. <laughs> and so obviously that did not work because I am here. I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> did not work. But my mother learned to make the coconut drops. And um, she taught me. I was going to high school. Things were very tough. My mother had taken two grandkids because my eldest sister also got pregnant as a teenager. And uh, so there's a cycle. There's a cycle, my grandmother, my mother, my elder sister, and I wanted a way to break the cycle. Coconut Drops provided me that way to break the cycle. I'm um, going to high school, my mother said, you have to find a way, because she, she was like, I'm doing my best and I'm still complaining. She was like, you'll have to find a way to get out of this to help yourself. That was a harsh reality. Um, there were options, either I was, I was gonna find a way or I go, and find a man, because that was a trend. And um, Coconut Job saved me, and um, sold it in high school, but there's a stigma that is attached to selling Coconut Drops. It's sold by people who are on 
uneducated, people who um, are poor, it's associated with poverty and failures, and you do it because you wanna survive, subsistence living. Um, I had to decide whether I was going to absorb the stigma and earn my money or kind of like, oh, I'm better than that, <laughs> and then go the route that would eventually end up with my life being in the same cycles of abuse. And so um, in grad school, I, I wanted to, I, I wanted to challenge myself to do, to establish myself as an artist, to note. My undergrad work, and this is not me bragging, my undergrad work was, was excellent, and I've been told that that was a master's level exhibition called Heirloom, Celebrating My Mother. And, and that work celebrated intangible heirlooms like gifts and skills and, and, and songs that are never written, but they are handed down and music and dancing. Um, so uh, intangible heirlooms. And, and it still follows through with this work <laughs> because the skill that my mother taught me, the recipe, heirloom. Yeah, so that's also a continuation. And um, I was doing a series with blocks and my professor said, you know, I was talking about, started talking about my great grand. And she said, what if you use the blocks? What if you got the blocks? I started using the blocks. And then for my final review, it just, it's spiritual. So the spirits intervened and said, what if you use the coconut drops recipe to make those blocks? And that was when I was like, wow, this is the work. <laughs> this is the work that's gonna top my BFA work. And, um, <laughs> I, I, I said, wow, because I know the material. I've been working with it from I was 13. I know the consistency of it. I know, you know, that if, if, if you put too much water in it, you know, if, if it cooks too long, I know, I know it. And I know that if I got the right molds, then it will work. Mm. So I started, um, uh, oh, stay here. No, no, I, I'm, I'm wondering if I'm on point because I should still say what I'm navigating in the work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, you are, you are saying what okay. you're navigating. You are saying what you're navigating. Okay, so okay. All right. <laughs> so um, I, I, I started, co I collected, started collecting coconuts. My mm -hmm. um, semester started in August and I started collecting coconuts right after <laughs> my, my review in May. And these are like hundreds of coconuts in, in, in Florida. And the, um, a lot of the, the area that I live in, very um, um, suburban, and uh, they don't, I don't know if they don't know the purpose, they don't know to, but they don't eat the coconuts, they don't eat the fruits. Um, and so my friend, my landlord's friend, gathered the coconuts for me, and I gathered as well. They will fall off the trees on the roadside, I'll pick them up. And um, then I needed a way to, de-host them, because it's normally done with a machete, but that, that t you have to exert so much energy. And to do hundreds of the, these are, <laughs> this was like probably five, 600 coconuts. And I, so I needed to find a way to de-host them. I did some research, and I saw the, uh, people in like Malaysia and those places, they have um, some, look at some shards that they put the coconuts on and they rack it. And so I did that, and then I was like, this, works, but it's still not efficient enough. And so I made another tool, so I'm in a metal shop working. I'm gathering wood from the neighborhood that people will throw out, wood they're renovating, and I'm collecting pine wood. And um, so this work is called Reclamation and Remembering Ode to the Building Blocks of My Narrative, the entire show. And so excerpts of it are in um, this exhibition right now. And so this work is about gathering insignificant stuff, detritus, um, stuff that are thrown out, and I gather them and make them into something new. Yeah. Um, so the work that I'm, that I'm, that I'm, that I'm doing, I'm, I'm just gonna switch a little bit to, mm -hmm. to what it is that I'm navigating. It's a lot of things, 
and it's multi-layered. Uh, and I, I took notes <laughs> <laughs> from my thesis. <laughs> All right, so it says, um, this is what I wrote. <laughs> um, so I'm navigating the intergenerational transference and transformation of history and culture through the symbolic transmutation of a maternal family recipe that is first and foremost. I'm also navigating legacies. I'm navigating diasporic memory um, because the thing, like, like my grandmother, I, everything just came back. And um, I'm navigating remembering uh, in general. And um, I'm gonna quote Michael Twitik uh, because I, I've, my work is also influenced by literature. Um, Venus in Two Acts, um, uh, In Search of Our Mother's Gardens, and um, The Cooking Gene by Michael Twitik. And he says, history is encoded in material culture. They are used to depict historical experiences, historical memories, and um, totems possess an innate familiarity that's transported for, transported me back, and it transports us back. So I'm able to connect with Olish's work mm -hmm. because there's just something that connects with me. Mm -hmm. it's, it's like it's a familiarity mm -hmm. that I can't put my finger on, but it's like I'm drawn to it. Mm -hmm. And I'm drawn to Nafisi's mm -hmm. work. Mm -hmm. And I can't put my finger on it, but I'm drawn to it. And so these totems, <laughs> these spiritual, it's, uh, it's spiritual, my work, comes from a spiritual place, and um, I, I if if it's not if it's not um, signed or or endorsed by the spirit, and they tell me exactly what to do, how to do, because this work, I I had to I was the scientist, I was the carpenter, I was the chef. I was the chemist, I was the photographer, I was the editor, I was, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, but I, I kept going and I kept going and I couldn't stop because I needed to give birth mm -hmm. to whatever was inside and I, I couldn't fail. I had a limited amount of time, limited amount of money, so I had to work, I got the wood <laughs> and um, during the process, and this is very important, very, very, very important. And I will do an exhibition going deep, we're gonna do a deep dive into this, that um, I was suspended while going through all of that. I experienced extreme microaggressions, blatant racism, it was just extreme. And I was suspended two weeks before candidacy and I was told I'm no longer a teaching assistant, I'm a research assistant. This is a sculpture department, this is not art history. Mm -hmm. And um, so I had to return my keys for the department. I was told that I needed retraining to use the equipment. And I was like, no, but I've been supervising undergrads for two years and there have been no incidents on my watch. Why? <laughs> and they say it's a legal matter in terms of they say I have all the emails that I'm gonna exhibit. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I was like, what are you people doing? I make art, I tell the stories of my life. You're giving me material? Thank you. <laughs> uh, and so um, I had to work from home. My friend John, who collects the coconuts for me, he's a jack of all trades, so he has every tool. I said, John, do you, have, do you happen to have a table saw? He says, I do, <laughs> and it's portable. And we took it, transformed my landlord's garage into my home studio, and we did the work. We got it done. And I had to tap into the spirit of my ancestors, and I channel channeled my great-grandmother. And um, I was able to, I was able to, to, to do the work I was able to
Uh, the work was, um, my, my apologies, my apologies, my apologies. Yeah, so um, in telling my story, the work was done. I got candidates, needless to say. Um, the exhibition was done. And I think more than, more, than, more than the degree, right, I just remember what I was going to say. Jeez, may I get old? <laughs> old age. <laughs> I can't bother. <laughs> um, so I was able to, 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 to finish the work. And um, God is good. Um, Okay, this is no, <laughs> no, this is spiritual, it's okay, this is spiritual, oh, God is in control, God is in control, <laughs> all right, so, um, did the work, did the buildings, other stuff, did the molds, never did woodwork in my life, I was able to do the patterns, and it's a funny thing that I was able to do the, the construction of the molds, because my father, and I don't really talk a lot about my father because he was unresolved, he was a troubled man and um, alcoholic, but he's a very skilled woodworker. And um, he, I was able to, to do those moves and complete the work that he did not get to complete. And so this work, it, like I said, is multi-layered and um, his unresolve, I was able to resolve. Can you flip back to the mold, um, Kijo? His unresolve, I was able to resolve to say, and in, in a way to say he was so gifted, he was so skilled, but he never did the work with his skills. There was nothing handed down for generations. There was nothing handed down for the posterity. And um, so these were the first two molds that I did. And... Um, yeah. So I, I, I did get candidacy mm -hmm. on the day that they, that they prescribed, and they said, oh, this is the day that you're going to present. And I said, no, but as a final year grad, you get to choose everything. You get to be boss. And I got an email to say, as the chair of your committee, this is the date for your candidacy, and this is the time. And I sent back and said, who made you chair? Because I already chosen everything. And they said, well, we had a discussion, and I am now your chair. And this is the day for your candidacy. This was two weeks after I got suspended from the department. This was two weeks. And that drove me to tap into the spirit of my ancestors and my grandmother to say that the women, we were, they were given nothing to work with. And they had to survive, and they had to do the work. And they were raped, and they were beaten, and they were, you know. And you still had to do the work. And this was the same thing I experienced. I had no tools. I had no equipment. I had, they shut down everything. And I knew no need to get, I had no pass to the, to the department. Because I know my little work like late night, because I'm an overnight person. And I put in the hours if there's a free, space slot in the studio, I'm there, I'm working. And I had no access to that. I had to leave like 9 o'clock like everybody else. And um, so this drove me, and that was a point that kept slipping me. <laughs> <laughs> so so this, this, this drove me to tap in. And I was guided how to do the work and what to do. And they said, we encountered their ancestors, and we won. And we are waiting for, we won. We are waiting for you all to come into that knowledge. And let me, let me, let me go into um, Alice Walker's seminal essay, In Search of My Mother's Gardens. And she states, these, ro these Ro um, roses, as uh, she's talking about flowers and gardens, 
these vases of, of, of flowers um, memorialize her as an artist who left her mark in the only materials she could afford and in the only medium her position in society allowed her to use. And this is talking about the mothers, the black women, and the grandmothers, and the trauma, and it happens today. And the trauma has not been addressed. And they give black women burdens to carry. Don't give me your burdens. I bear no burdens and I carry no resentment. What they went through was atrocious and was based on an experiment and a lie. And this work that I am doing is navigating the truth about them to undo the lies about us. Yeah? We, they were brilliant. They were beaten to nothing. And they had to survive. I come from them. And how history depicts them. Black, the extra lips and the caricatures. Yeah? I do not ascribe to that. And it continues, because we have not confronted those lies, they expect me to walk in that stereotype and the stigma. And if I don't fall in line, you get punished, you get suspended from the department. You are difficult. You are. When we start talking the truth about them, because we have been regurgitating what has been said about them. And the truth has not been told. So we find this conflict and this war happening, and they expect me to walk in this mall. No. And that's why I went back and I used the little things, the domesticated things, the cooking. Because Michael Twitty says, let me go to Mr. Twitty. About food. I'm coming. <laughs> 3A. Food is, in many cases, all we have. All we, all we can go to in order to feel our way into our past. And that is why it was so important for me to do the food. And um, for us, food is the, gate, is the gateway into larger conversations about individual and group survival again. I survived because of the coconut jobs. It broke the cycles, right? Um, our food has not just been fodder for, her, for our journeys, but embodies the journeys themselves. You know, so it's taking what my, the work that I'm doing, especially with this body of work, because I've evolved from just talking about trauma. This work is not about trauma. It's about survival. It's about overcoming trauma. It's about their resilience. It's about their strength. Um, and it's, it's about subverting, erasing. And that, that, that thing of erasure, I got it from um, inspired by Titus Kafar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, white it out, yeah. <laughs> mash it up, yeah, move them out of the way, yeah, 
And so, so I, I, this work is so deliberate in not talking about whiteness and the stain and the sting of it. No, it's about the women who survived, the ancestors who did, they were told that they were animals and mute, uh, uh, and they were mocked and jeered, but they knew that we would come. And so and they endured. When Massa come, and the rapes, and the rapes, and the rapes, they stopped resisting. They gave it freely. They became these mules, Venus, yeah? And because they knew that we were coming, and we would know eventually, eventually. And so it's, it's, it's also about my story. And this is not to trigger anybody, but y'all got to know where I'm coming from and why I do what I do and why I only listen to what the Spirit says, what the work should be. Because this is not commodity. What I do is to lay a foundation for the generations to come. Because I have taken cues from those who were before in the simplicity of who they are, how they moved, what they did to survive, to make themselves beautiful. They had to do those affirmations. What is my sing? What is my gardening? For Alice Walker, she said, the garden was her mother's thing. That was, that was her thing. That made her like, God, like, like she was powerful, she was creator, she had purpose. And, and so I'm pulling from them, and I'm saying, beautiful flower, I acknowledge you. You are beautiful, you are here, and I acknowledge your spirit. I feel you, I love you. Beautiful flower, I know that you are here. And these are my, my, my songs. The work, there are altars to them. Um, this is called Legacy and Redemption. The legacy that they have left for me to continue in. And redemption that they were not slaves. They were upright, they were beautiful, they were strong. If somebody's going to tell you that they're, they're going to beat you to death, they were wise, they submitted. They resisted and they were being killed. And they knew that they had to live. And so they submitted. And they took on the stuff. You're gonna call me <laughs> minstrel. No, we'll take it. <laughs> we'll do it. <laughs> we'll do it. Because we have to preserve the seed. The seed has to come. And so <laughs> This is Legacy and Redemption, and I set up this one, the one on the, on the left. This is how the work was set up in the space. And then this was the Friday, the show opened on the Saturday, and by Monday I went in, it started bleeding. Organically, not planned. This, they just started showing out. <laughs> and this, I, like I said, the work is spiritual. And so this was blood, because sugar was cultivated in, in blood. And so the blocks were crying out. The blocks are testifying. Yeah? This one is called building blocks. They're damaged, they're chipped. This process, I tell you this work, this, this process was, I, had to, I was just working. And the sugar is fickled, it's fickled like glass. If the temperature is off, if the ratio is off, if the temperature drops a little bit, if I use too much water, if, if it's a science. And some of, some of the times, and I have a quota to meet and I have a timeline. And some of them, and I could get it perfectly right, and then I'm demolding because I have to apply Pressure, tap, 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 tap. This is brittle, like glass. 
So I'm tapping, it's coming out, and then they split open. I was like, my God. <laughs> <laughs> and so some of them, I was able to patch them, make another set of, 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 of liquid, pour it on, stick it back together and see if they will stick. This one with the crap, it, I, it, I couldn't save it. I was like, what do I do? There's so much work and there's so much money that has gone into this. I was like, I can't throw them away. But I said, in a construction site, since we're talking about building and foundations and laying, you have pallets where you have the damaged ones. Mm. You might not use all of it, or you can chip a piece of it, and it can still. And then I was like, yeah, but the ancestors, they were, they were, they were flawed. They were flawed. But they still did the work. They still accomplish. And so this, this one is um, Queen Abbey. It's the only one that I did with a silicone mold. And um, this thing was stuck in the silicone because of the texture of the block that I use as, as, as the mold. But what it, and also the significance of the concrete with Queen Abbey. Could you say a little bit about that? Oh, the, oh, the concrete. Um, my my, my great-grandmother was one of the first persons in her community to, 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 to own a house made of concrete blocks. That's that a symbol that is, you know. And, and so it would be, it was just great to go to the big house in the, in the village. And I think we'll return, I think, Nadine, to talk a little bit more about the altar if we have time. But I do want to turn to Nafisa's work because what I think is connecting is when we get back to this idea of what are the foundations and the building blocks that are infused in your work and that it is generational. For you, you had sort of immediate access to a particular touchstone, and Nafisa has been searching and guided by, but not in direct contact um, with some of the influences. So I thought we might turn to that, and then we can return sure. to um, your altar. But thank you so much. Thank you so much. Incredible. And so Nafis M. White, who is presenting both Oculus and Self-Portrait in our Bates Gallery, um, wanted to speak with you about what it is that you're navigating in those works. So I have one installation shot of um, the space that you're occupying, this 12-foot long table, um, as well as this 8.5-foot in diameter Oculus. So maybe we'll start. Here? Oh, we can start there. <laughs> we can start there. I just want to take a moment just to reach out and stretch out, you know, just to take a moment. If you all take a moment just, you know, to move, you know, and then we come back. Oh, because I just want to acknowledge that we have been given already so much beautiful energy and story, and I just want to anchor that and just hold that, you know. So what am I navigating? Y'all, I'm navigating love, and I'm navigating home, OK? And um, Oculus is, um, you know, it's made of synthetic hair. This particular iteration is about eight and a half feet in diameter. Top to bottom in the gallery, please visit. Um, and it is hair, embodied knowledge, ancestral recall, audacity of survival, and bobby pins. So this entire structure, because we got, you know, I mean, you know, hair does not like glue usually, okay? So bobby pins uh, are a very big part of this work also, uh, and we'll get into that. But this piece came around because of, um, because of love and because of self-love. Um, because of searching, I'm an adoptee. And I want to start with that because, uh, you know, um, there was a lot of a stigma, you know, associated with being an adoptee coming up also, you know, uh, uh, you know, who is your family, you know, who has adopted you, all of that. Um, I got very lucky. So I was born in Texas. And, uh, you know, uh, my family, my mother is English and Scottish. And my father is African-American and Italian. 
And, um, you know, coming up, uh, you know, I started getting curious about origins, right? Because I'm being introduced to my grandmother from Glasgow and, you know, her man who was at Pearl Harbor, you know, during World War II. And then uh, being introduced, of course, and brought in to my father's family, you know, and having like my great aunt making yoki, you know, chain smoking at the kitchen, you know, while she's like using a fork to kind of make these forms. Uh, so I've got all these traditions and all of these energies and all of this um, beauty. And also, I had a really deep longing inside because, you know, I, I just, there's a missing link, right? And so I was like, how, uh, how, do I, how do I begin to navigate that and start to find, like also to have the courage to look? Um, I think my mother was challenged with that, you know, and a little intimidated, to be quite honest, um, in uh, me finding or reaching out or trying to search, right? Because, you know, sometimes, you know, we, we're afraid of being abandoned, you know, especially when we're putting love into something, you know? And so, um, but, you know, the calling is there, right? I have a birth mother somewhere, right? I have a birth father. And through a little bit of genealogy and working with um, people who are called angels, um, who work with adoptees, uh, trying to you know kind of connect you to your birth family, um, through some of those links, you know, discovering okay, so my my mother English, Scottish, Welsh, my father African American, okay, um, you know, trying to dig deeper into that. Um, but every time you start opening the book on that. You start going down the road, and then sometimes those roads end. And so these works really came about, um, you know, uh, endings, beginnings, you know, this kind of undulation in this movement as I'm searching and finding answers, and then sometimes the paths go cold, you know, and then starting again. Um, so that is, um, yeah, a major part of, of that um, particular work. But also, mm -hmm. I want to emphasize yes. that yes. the way that these works are bound yes. is not with adhesive. No. Right. But right. with bobby pins. That's right. And so even as mm -hmm. the um, art handlers were erecting this piece, uh -huh. they were remarking on how light it was. Right. Versus how weighty it feels, like yeah. the gravity of the work. And mm -hmm. then once it was up, each of those handlers stepped back and just stood and looked at it for a moment. Mm -hmm. It was really a powerful mm -hmm. moment inside of that space. Yeah. But I wanted to, as I told you, place mm -hmm. it with your self-portrait because I feel like it gives yeah. a, a more holistic view yeah. um, of you. So maybe mm -hmm. we'll talk a little bit about, yeah. about that. I'm going to yeah. use this one since it is yeah. I do what is in our space. But please. Oh, yeah. Yes. No, I do want to mention that because um, I think about bodies, I think about our bodies when I'm creating work. Um, these are, and I didn't mention this, but let me jump into this. Um, so I don't sketch these works. I ask for divine intervention. When I'm working on them, I'm working on them on the floor. I listen to house music. I live for that, you know. I'm usually listening to friends, mixes, um, you know, produce music, you know, uh, DJ, and really um, alchemizing that, right? The rhythm section, this jazz happening in that work, okay? And so getting into that, um, moving, grooving, letting it uh, kind of indicate what it wants, um, and then processing through. So, um, but in terms of bodies, when we talk about the articulation, the movement, you know, kind of getting out of the way, you know, sometimes you all have to get out of the way of the work. I don't know if y'all have that experience. Yeah, right? <laughs> so, um, but I do think about, you know, who's touching it? Um, I need it to be lightweight. You know, as a sculptor, I'm in my studio by myself quite a lot. And so what that requires is, you know, my own strength and dexterity to move and to create things. But I also want to extend that care and that love to those who are uh, feeling it, who are moving it. And I talked with some of the installers because we were vibing out in that room, you know, before the openings. And, um, and one gentleman said, you know, I felt like we were cared for because it was light. And that is very intentional. It's um, it's and also the way that they come together too is quite intuitive as well. Um, I just want to provide maps and care um, because not everybody thinks about that. And I think that um, just with the interpretations of my work, 
I want to be responsible for all the different kinds of interpretations that happen. As an artist, I need to think very th seriously and thoroughly about all the different ways that it can be, um, you know, just uh, speak. Um, I want to be conscious of that. Yeah. So, um, in conversation, so if I'm searching for family, I'm looking for them. The bobby pins, there are thousands in this. I use pliers, I augment them. Uh, I lay the work down and I put it through. Now, I'm just going to, can I share the substructure? Do you all want to know? All right. Quarter inch plywood, rigid foam overlay, paint, 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 paint. <laughs> and then, you know, allow the materials to speak weave, move, colors, all of that. And then, you know, take the bobby pins and put them in. The bobby pins are an homage to my grandmothers, you know, so every time I put them in, I think about them. I think about the love that they've given. I think about the self-love, how they taught me to love my curls and my identity, you know, how they held me close. Because my adoptive mother, although powerful and wonderful and I adore her, was quite intimidated by black women and had a difficult time also allowing me into the circle of black women and my grandmother saw this and luckily was very stubborn she's a Scorpio too I love her <laughs> shout out to Louise uh, and she said no my baby is gonna come here I'm gonna you know guide her along so identity I'm also navigating and perception I'm also navigating. So when we go from something like Oculus, which is a ritual object, which I imbue synthetic hair, it's not real hair because that has a lot of energy. And you gotta be ready to work with that. You gotta be ready. Um, yeah, synthetic, you can push that love in and I want that to be a testament. Like I want it to be vibrating and holding and you know, um, enveloping you with a lot of care and a lot of movement and um, creativity and then, Licorice, okay. Black licorice, black licorice. Okay, who likes black licorice? I'm just curious. Okay, okay. Who, right? Who, who, okay. Who does not like black licorice? Yeah, okay, so you will be changed. You will be changed. Um, because I detested it. So may I tell a little story? Okay, um, I used to live in San Francisco and um, uh, I worked at a place, I was going to City College of San Francisco, hence actually why I came here uh, initially. Uh, City College of San Francisco, studying art, very inspired, met Glenn Morawaki, you know, contemporary art historian, fabulous man, said you had to go to Moad, I did. Saw David Hammonds here, lost my mind. I thought, wow, this exists, it's incredible. Um, but while I was working, you know, or while I was going to school full time, uh, you know, and volunteering here, which is how I started many moons ago, I'm not going to tell you how long, but we got silver, honey. So, you know, it's been a minute, it's been a minute. Um, but I worked for Miette, which is a French confessory in Hayes Valley, because I like candy and I'm very Mary Poppins. I don't know if y'all know that. So I like whimsy. And, uh, you know, I remember going in there and, you know, starting to work and there was a wall and there was licorice. I said, why would you do that? Why would you do that? It's disgusting. I can't stand this. And they said, well, I think you're being quite judgmental, Nafis. I think you, you may be not seeing something. And I say, oh, I see it. I already know what it is. It's black licorice. I know what that is. Like, I don't need an explanation about it. You know, and they said, well, you know, maybe when we're slow, one of these days, like, try some. So, you know, we did have a slow day one day, and I thought, you know, Sometimes you're kind of hungry, you need a little snack. <laughs> you know, so I was like, let me have a little. And I tell you what, textures, sense, tactility. I mean, they're little sculptures in and of themselves. Like I was smitten because what I thought I thought wasn't really what it was, okay? So I started thinking about black licorice as a very polarizing kind of material, you know? Uh, people have definitive ideas around that. And so I thought it would be the perfect medium to create an exhibition, an offering, um, to maybe ask people to rethink what they think about what they think they think they know, right? So here, you know, uh, is self-portrait in the gallery. And um, you are welcome to walk through and, and sample it. I can also be your licorice sommelier and guide you through. Because I'm gonna tell you, there are some intense, intense flavors, you know, and you know, I like, the baby, 
<laughs> the starfish, the starfish. If you, listen, it'll it'll take the breath right out. Like I can I can give you a tour. I can I can be nice and gentle. We can be on a lovely lake and just you know you'll feel the sun beat down. You know, and I can also take you into a place where there's a lot of aggregate, where there's a lot of tension and energy and like you know something that'll remain with you. Self-portrait though, I thought about identity, and I thought about blackness. And in that room are 30 jars of black licorice, but not all of it's looking black, and you know, maybe it's not all tasting like we think it's gonna taste. But I wanted to address that blackness is not monolithic, you know? And neither are other identities, you know? And I wanted to ask or invite people to partake, um, to consider, like, okay, so maybe you have this idea of something, but what if you take the time to savor it? Like, what if you take the time to slow down and really investigate it and see it? Um, and I thought it would be a way through love to kind of bring people a little bit closer to each other, you know? Because maybe what you thought about that person or that group of people is wrong. You know, maybe what you thought, uh, you know, was just misaligned. You know, maybe you do need to give something another chance, you know, and see kind of where you go. What do you learn from that? Um, Self-portrait also for me, because it's self, you know, and I had to talk about myself a little bit. I don't talk about this too much in the work, but I'm going to tell y'all because, you know, you're here, and I'm very happy that you are here. Thank you for deciding to be here tonight. Um, but some of the licorice types, uh, you know, are their experiences, you know, for me. So a good and plenty, for example, would be, um, you know, my mother and I have had a lot of tension in the past, for example. And not all relationships are easy, um, but some relationships are really worth fighting for. And my mother's mother from Glasgow, well, for one, she didn't like black people, so that was a problem, you know? And as I was coming up as a kid, it was like, oh, you know, they're dirty, and these ki they're always gonna be dirty. And, you know, and my mother um, was really pushed away from her mother, you know, really kind of abandoned. And so through no fault of my mother's, but she was kind of, you know, constantly pushing me away as well. And I decided, no, I'm gonna stay, I'm gonna stay, because I want to be close, I want to build something. So good and plenty is like the sweetness, you know, because my mother likes it, and because it reminds me of that gorgeousness, you know, that sweetness of what we have decided both of us you know, um, to keep, you know. And then there are some that are a little more challenging, and those might be indicative of some real challenges, maybe similar to Nadine, you know, like the tension of going through an institution, you know, where you are authorized but not recognized, you know, where you're dealing with things that other people don't have to deal with, um, you know, and navigate those kinds of avenues. So um, self-portrait is really, um, yeah, an offering to walk with me in a different way, you know, and walk with each other, and um, maybe challenge some of those perceptions and hopefully make the world a little bit softer for each other. Thank um. you, thank you so much. And I do, um, I, I know we are up on the edge of time, it is now eight, but I would like to be able to <laughs> offer, as I, I think I said before we even started this talk, I was like, if we get five words out of me, I don't want it. I was like, these folks know how to speak about their work. Um, but I do want to allow a few minutes for question and answer. Um, so if anyone has a question, please um, let us know. And Nia will walk around with the uh, microphone. Questions? <laughs> Sorry. So I think we will wrap things up. I do want to just quickly show you some more of the oculi um, by, by Nafis. So they come in a variety of sizes from tiny to, so you can see how they are arrayed. Yeah, that's a seven footer. Yes. Um, so I, and um, just to tell you all, the one installed here is in four sections. Um, again, care for the body, 
Also, ease and travel. Also, my doors in my studio ain't that big. Okay? <laughs> so you can't design something huge and then you know think you're going to walk out with it. That's a seven-footer on the previous um, image. Those are two feet diameter works and also about eight, eight uh, inches diameter works just to give you some, you know, some, some but scale. it's also fascinating how the surfaces vary, so it gives credence to that idea that yes. you're being directed, that right. it isn't necessarily a grid that you are following or That's a right. pattern that you're following. That's right. Yeah, very much so intuitive, yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then <gasps> this... You know, so um, so these are those hair yes. bobbles, and so thinking about the sphere, the the ways in which the circle works in your work, Does. Um, as well as the kind of play and playing with childhood. So one yes. of the first things I ever saw from the feast was oh. a small room, completely filled with black ice air fresheners from cars, like up and down and then a video of her with her hair and long braids with the bobbles all around and shaking like this yeah. and I know and it was the immediate nostalgia of that click clack that was my favorite thing to do after that yes. four hours of sitting between yes. Miss Bonnie's legs yes. while she braided and tortured my poor head yes. was that the kitty clack uh -uh. right and yes. then the black ice which every black man I know puts Listen. that black ice air freshener in his car. Yeah. So there was this this like layered experience no facts. that ha occurred in that small space. Facts. Yeah, I just want to shout out real quick, that last piece is called All In. It's a 16 foot diameter on the floor, all hair bobbles, tens of thousands of them, then overlaid with thousands of prisms so that it winks at you. Mm -hmm. It is called All In, but it's after Tony Fair because we got to give some shout out to our families, okay? And so I like to pay homage I love Tony Fair's practice. I think it's gorgeous. I think it's just super real. And when I was looking around in my art studio with all that hair, what else did I have? I had bobbles. So it's just, you know, really shout out to, to the fam, you know? Yes. Oh. And we'll, I think we're going to. We can do what you want. They will talk with you about these later. So print totally the whole thing. So we will come back. So please follow us on social media. <laughs> and. Fill out the survey. Uh -huh. And did you know that in four uh, programs, you have paid for your membership? So you should get a membership today if you don't have one. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much okay. to Nadine, to Oluche, mm -hmm. to Nafis. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your practice with us. Mm -hmm. And please come back, spend some time in the galleries. Mm -hmm. And um, this uh, was recorded and will be on our YouTube channel. Okay. So you'll be able to watch again and delve more deeply. Uh -huh. Thank you so much, everybody, for hey. being here. Hey. <laughs>